Hello. Welcome once again to Advanced Financial Analysis. Let's get started with our first chapter. This class is different from a typical accounting class because we are looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, most accounting courses focus on the preparer. So you're learning how to prepare um, a set of financial statements. This course, we're going to focus on the user's experience. So we want to look at how would someone use the financial statement. Um, one of the most important um, use for financial statements is to value a firm. To start with, be aware that valuation is more of an act, not a science. And so uh, there are a lot of more ambiguity um, and a lot more judgment involved um, in the materials in this class. So for example, let's think about an investor. What would the investor need from a company's financial statements in order for them to decide whether or not a firm is a good investment? Um, the other way, the other user uh, of financial statements are managers. So what would managers um, get from financial statements that will help them improve their management of the firm? In valuation analysis, um, a lot of times we talk about a top-down valuation analysis. Uh, what that means is, in addition to just the data that is contained within the financial statement, we also draw from other um, data. First of all, we look at, so at the very, very top level, we look at the global macroeconomic conditions. Um, are we heading into a recession? Are we going into an expansion? Different economic conditions will dictate different reactions from a company. Uh, another aspect is how the um, government uh, in the U.S. that will include the Federal Reserve, um, how are they um, currently reacting to the economic conditions? What are their um, driving uh, fiscal and monetary policies? Uh, fiscal policies refer to um, what Congress typically do in terms of spending uh, and tax policies, and monetary policies has to do with the Federal Reserve um, in their interest interest rate and um, also um, how much um, currency uh, money are they um, injecting or circulating in the economy. In addition to that, um, within the global macroeconomic um, context, um, each industry also have their own unique characteristics. So when you look at a firm, we need to place the firm in the context of its industry. So there are different degree of competition in the industry. If this is a mature industry, competition will be much more, uh, much higher than an industry that is relatively new. Um, also, some industry have higher barriers to entry, particularly industry that requires a lot of investment to get started or have licenses or patents that can create barriers to entry that will reduce competition. Um, in today's day and age, the speed of innovation, we talk about creative destruction, um, that is definitely something to keep in mind. And then finally, um, what is the relative buying power or the relative power of the firm um, in relation to its suppliers and its consumers? So if there are very few um, firms in the industry, you will have more leverage. Um, also, if the size of the firm is big relative to its suppliers, then you may also have some leverage. So all those are unique characteristics that we need to take into account. And then finally, we look at the firm itself. And these are non-financial um, uh, data, but the financial data will help us uh, review what is the firm's characteristics. So these are um, marketing strategies, management strategies. So for example, does a firm in, within the industry, does a firm try to be the lowest cost producer? Uh, so in that case, that is, a, that is a strategy. And we can look at in the financial statement, does the firm, uh, is the, the firm's cost uh, really lower than its competitors? And by that, we can confirm from the financial statement whether or not a firm is successfully implementing its strategy. 
all the firm is trying to um, rather than being the cost leader, the firm may want to create products that are different. So product and surface differentiation is a strategy that oftentimes will enable a company to charge a higher price for its product and services. And we again, we'll be able to see that through um, the profit margin from the financial statement. So a firm that pursue a product surface differentiation strategy, we expect them to have a higher profit margin compared to a firm that is a cost leader. Um, and then finally, we look at the value chain integration. So we'll, we'll take a little bit. We'll talk a little bit more about what is a value chain and how does a firm insert itself, uh, position itself inside the value chain, and what can we expect to see in the financial statement. So here is a picture of a value chain. A value chain is basically a representation of everything that a firm has to do in order to provide the products or services to its customers. Uh, so you start with um, getting supplies, so that's inbound logistics, and then you will also um, have to run the operation of the firm. And then you have to then deliver your product or services to the customers. Um, and then there is also um, sales and marketing and then also um, post sales. So this is um, after you have sold the product to the customer and you may still have sales and support. So these are the post sales services. And a firm could um, decide to emphasize one or more elements of the value chain. So for example, a firm that pursue a uh, product and service differentiation strategy may put more emphasis on marketing and sales and also post sales service relative to a cost leader. A cost leader may focus on the operations and the delivery part to make sure that they, they, they minimize their cost um, relative to a product differentiation firm. So as I said, this, this um, course, we're going to um, focus on the financial statements, but we're going to link information from the financial statement to a firm's operating strategy. So for example, um, we can look at its revenue, and then we can look at its revenue growth, and we can ask, is the firm's revenue growth consistent with the life cycle of the firm in the industry. So a, a, in, a, in a new industry, in the early life cycle, we will expect much higher revenue growth versus a firm in a mature industry, we'll expect revenue, revenue growth to be more stagnant. Um, again, cost is important. We can look at the strategy associated with that. And then we also look, look at the efficiency. So when we look at efficiency and uh, we can compute ratios and we're going to learn how to use financial statement to compute ratios that help us identify the operation efficiency of the firm. And finally, very important is profitability of a company. Um, we look at the growth from year to year as a percentage. Um, very important is also the sustainability of earnings. Once again, when we will we'll use um, metrics that help us um, drill down to look at what is really behind the earnings and what is behind the earnings growth and therefore help us identify whether or not those are sustainable. And then of course, we are also concerned about the quality of earnings. So quality of earnings there here has two aspects. One is the quality of the financial information themselves. And then the second is, well, what is, once again, what is driving earnings? In addition to profit, there's in finance, um, we are concerned about both return, which are profit, as well as risk. So we want to look at the firm's operating leverage. So this has to do with fixed cost. Uh, higher fixed cost will increase the operating leverage. Um, next is financial leverage. Financial leverage has to do with whether a firm, uh, how much debt a firm use in its capital structure. Uh, in addition to that, there's also market risk. And there are two types of market risk here. One is market risk 
um, of the industry that the firm operates in. So is it um, is this a cyclical type industry? A cyclical industry is an industry where sales tend to go high during uh, economic expansion and then much lower during uh, a recession. And then there's also the market risk that's related to the stock price of the firm that investor may be, will be uh, concerned about. So there's uh, the market risk that has to do with cyclicality um, are of interest to both a manager and an investor. And then um, the, the market risk that's associated with the stock um, are of primary interest to the investor, but can also affect manager as well because um, the, abil- the, market, the market risk and the stock price does affect a firm's ability to raise future funds. So what we need to do is to take the information from the financial statements and then we um, triangulate that with what we know about the firm and the industry and are they consistent? Do they make sense? Here are the typical steps in a financial statement analysis. So the first step is, as I said, the top-down approach. We look at the economic characteristics and the industry characteristics. So that's step one. And then, um, and this is true for for all the firms in the industry and the other um, other. Um, industries in the economy. So this is a macro level analysis. Uh, Second, we look at the company's strategy. So what is the company doing? Is the company trying to pursue, uh, what is it, where does it emphasize within its value chain? So this is a micro level um, analysis. And then we're going to ex- we're going to also look at the quality of the financial statements so we will talk about that um, and then we'll use the financial data from the fa- from the statements to help us understand the profitability the growth and the risk of the company and then finally we're going to use those information and this is something um, unique about this class is so far we are looking at publicly available information, we are looking at historic information, but then now we have to use all this information that we have gathered, so both economic condition, firm strategy, and then we're going to look at the history of the firm, and we're going to put all this into projecting what the future is like. So when we say project future financial statements, what is important is what will be the cash flow like for the firm in the future. And based on that, we'll estimate the value of the firm. So a very important caveat here as well, um, when when we estimate the future value of the firm, our estimate may or may not match the stock price. And that has to do with the, first of all, that has to do with our valuation. So whether or not we are accurate. So we may, we may not in our analysis done correctly. So we may come up with a, a valuation that is wrong or our valuation is correct, but the market stock price is not reflective of the true valuation of the stock. So that's, um, and that's, that has to do with something called the efficient market hypothesis. So if the market is sufficient, then the stock price should correctly reflect all available information. And if that's the case, we, if we assume that the market is efficient, then the stock market price is always correct. And if our valuation does not match the stock price, then we are in the wrong. However, the market may not be 100% efficient, first of all. And second, if you are an internal manager of the firm, uh, you may have insider information. And that will allow you to come up with a valuation that is more accurate than the stock price, which reflects only publicly av- available information. 
So those are tricky things to navigate. Now, let's say if you are a financial analyst, you do not have inside the information, then you have to make a judgment call. So we talked about that earlier. So it is possible that the market, the stock market is not efficient and therefore the current stock price does not accurately reflect the true value of the firm and your valuation is is correct and that is the case where if that is the case then you may uh, identify a buying opportunity or a sell, selling opportunity as a stock investor and then finally, I want to emphasize um, about terminology that you will find in this class. Valuation, in particular this class, combines several disciplines. So first of all, there's accounting and finance, which is very obvious. Um, and just accounting and finance use different terminology and occasionally even different formulas. Um, but we also, when we bring into firm strategy, we also bring in marketing and management, right? And then when we talk about the economic environment, we also bring in concepts from economics. So we talk about the Federal Reserve, the fiscal policies. So we have all these dif different disciplines. So what happened is that it is not unusual for you to encounter different terms that refer to the same concept. So particularly um, you, when you work with colleagues uh, and your colleague may have um, a law background, for example, or economic background or a finance background, they may use different term, but you actually are talking about the same thing. So I will try to use as many terms as possible so that that as a challenge it can be slightly confusing but it also expand your knowledge and enable you to uh, be, be a better communicator um, when you work in the industry what is important is for you to remember that the goal is to estimate the value of the firm and that depends on the future earning in fact more importantly more important than future earning is future cash flows So how do we? So when industry changes, um, or when new technology emerges, sometimes uh, new financial ratios are developed. So when we talk about formulas, remember that these are we are trying to get to the value of a firm. These are not scientific formulas. They are not written in stone. They don't have um, un. Um, unchangeable or immutable uh, qualities to that, but rather the formulas um, and the ratios are there to help us better understand um, and compare different companies and create benchmarks. So let's take an example. Uh, in the retail industry, sales per square foot is a very important metric. Um, and that is true when most sales happen in a physical store. But what happened when sales move online? So there will not be any square foot per se when sales move online. And so when internet sales becomes uh, more and more important, we'll have to come up with new metrics and new benchmark for us to, um, to analyze um, this new company because now the physical store is no longer a key part of their business model. Okay, so here's an overview. And I want to say welcome again to this class. And I will see you very soon in the next chapter.